Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I've got a great guest today, Dr. Aman Bosley. He's a highly trained relationship counselor, a youth mentor, and a mindset coach. Uh, he is the author of a really amazing book called Essential TA, which means Transactional Analysis, a Common Sense Psychology. Transactional Analysis appears to me from you know my layperson's perspective as a, uh, a really interesting and useful way to figure out why, as an individual, I do the things I do, why people I interact with do the things they do, you know, what are the forces kind of driving them. Doc Busley will uh, explain that far better than I can, but... Just wanted to give him my first shot. So uh, welcome, Mom, and thank you for coming. Hey, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, if you would, let's start with your background. How did you get into this area of uh, transactional analysis and you know what was life like leading up to it? So I actually spent many years in Singapore as a media professional, and my discovery of transactional analysis was purely accidental. So I was going through a pretty nasty breakup. I had been cheated on. And I was uh, spending more time than I would have liked to feeling sorry for myself and, you know, just uh, not feeling good about my life. And I discovered a book called I Am Okay, You Are Okay at that time, largely because my mother is an avid reader, because she's also a practicing relationship counselor. So on reading that book, I found some of the ideas that were explored in that book pretty interesting. And what was fascinating to me was how your communication in relationships can be influenced by certain factors that you don't even know are at play because they have become second nature to you. They've become so deeply ingrained in your conditioning that you don't even know it's something that you are bringing to the table. You think it's fate or you think it's luck or you think it's accidental, but actually everything that happens to you has a foundation in what you bring to the table in terms of your attitude, your communication, your expectations, and the experiences you engineer as a result of these things. So I found that as a very fascinating takeoff point. So for example, if an individual such as myself is going through a breakup or has been cheated on, how did I contribute to this situation being what it is and for me being where I am. I thought that was an interesting switch of perspective rather than sort of just stewing in this sort of victim mindset of, oh my God, it's me mm. suffering alone in this horrible world. No one understands what I deserve. So I wanted to get out of that and wanted to sort of take ownership of my pain. And that's where I follow T it, make it very easy for me to sort of take off. Oh, question here before we before we go on um so it sounds like you know in order to even consider a situation from the perspective you're saying you have yes. to take ownership of it you have to allow for some part of the blame of it to be on you a lot of people i would think would be very uncomfortable doing that how do you even yeah. allow yourself to do such a well it's i suppose how i was raised my mom always said that uh, you know we have to learn to shoulder some of the responsibility in any situation where we uh, find ourselves uncomfortable or strangers to a solution right i mean definitely in india we have a saying right that uh, you know you can't clap with one hand you know you need two hands to clap 
So if something is messed up, something is clearly disharmonized and there's no balance, clearly you have had a role in either allowing it to get this way or your confusion, naivety, gullibility, vulnerabilities may have led to a blind spot in the way you lead your life. And that is what may have played a crucial role that is often overlooked because it's it's quite glamorous to sit and point fingers at everyone and try to blame the stars and your star sign and, <laughs> you know, uh, your luck. But it takes a truly brave individual to say, oh, what am I doing or not doing that is contributing to this problem and this mess I find myself in. Yeah, that's true. Also, too, I mean, even if you practice this, I would think you would be annoyed with other people, you know, why am I doing this and they're not doing it? Am I the only one that has to be the, you know, the one to, to think of both sides? It's, it feels like a burden in a way. Yeah, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I mean, to some degree, yes. But, you know, if you're the one suffering, if you, you know, if you have a thorn that's lodged inside your foot and others don't, I mean, it's your job to yank it out so that you can finally be relieved of the pain, right? I mean, so the onus is largely on me to be pain-free or to find myself in a better way or a better state and to engineer that. And of course, it's it's upsetting if you turn your recovery into a competition with what others are doing to recover or to atone for their mistakes. But it's not really a competition. It's really just your responsibility, the way I see it, to be better, to do better, and to just sort of dry yourself if you've gotten, you know, wet <laughs> in the flash floods of life. Okay. So, so you had this terrible breakup you were very hurt and then you you started to think how did i contribute to this and then what happened from there i think the literature i was exposed to helped me understand that there was a certain attitudinal framework within which i was operating that we now know in ta or transactional analysis is referred to as ego states and uh, you know there is a certain attitude that you bring to the table whereby it may seem that you want to rescue someone and save them even though they haven't asked you to do that for them you know it's kind of like you put on a cape and now you want to save the world and make everyone better and and i think that's what i was doing which may have created some kind of burden on my partner me trying to do everything to make things all right without taking into account certain logistical truths about a long distance relationship playing its own role in creating some kind of burden. So that to me was, I mean, now it seems pretty obvious to me, but it was a big revelation. And uh, what I really like about TA is we have some concepts in TA called drivers and how certain frameworks drive us and compel us and push us forward. And they almost have a magnetic hold over us, such as a tendency to want to project strength or a tendency to want to please others or a tendency to want to show other people how hard we're working or a tendency to want to you know, lean into a perfectionistic way of doing things, right? So certain concepts like that are quite simple to explain, even to an 11-year-old who doesn't like you. That's kind of my mantra, that if you can explain something, imagining the person listening to you is 11 years old and he doesn't really like you and he still understands what you're saying, then you're either doing a very good job of explaining it or you have found a concept that has such wide universal application that there is no doubt that they will understand what you're trying to say. So for me, the journey from theory to application was the journey that followed where I started teaching transactional analysis. In fact, one of my training programs is currently underway in Mumbai, India. We, I, I train people in TA at least twice or thrice a year. And uh, the book, of course, is the manual we use. So that's where I found myself. Did you explore uh, CBT, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectic therapy or like the other common ones out there? Did you go for help or was this something you figured out on your own? So my mom being an REBT trainer, I have trained in REBT. So, you know, REBT helps apply certain concepts. It's as TA is a little bit more analytical framework and a theory of personality. REBT is, a, or CBT, is a manual on how to direct the client through a variety of uh, methods. So yes, I do dabble in REBT, but some clients in India especially, I feel because there is a not still a widespread acceptance of 
therapy and also it may be expensive for some people i have noticed that you have to be very didactic and uh, you use storytelling to a large degree to illustrate certain concepts and really make clients comfortable with the idea that they are in a position where they require help because it can be quite humiliating for them to admit to their family and friends that they're going to therapy because of widespread misconceptions about the field such as therapy is just for crazy people or you have to be loony or really weak or you you have poor will power if you need a therapist none of which is true i think all of us in the journey of life get kicked a little bit get nicked a little bit and i think it's it's just natural to want to have an objective overview from time to time with someone just to navigate those dark passages with you hmm. i hope it's not uh, too personal but what has been your relationship with your mother that both of you now i mean like as growing up i would i would hope that she did a great job because of all her training but now that you're both adults and you relate to each other and you both have the training, how has that changed your relationship, you feel? Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from $10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. I find my mother to be a someone I feel very inspired by. And yet, uh, I also see how high a standard she holds herself to, whether it's how she conducts herself or the astuteness with which she's able to, you know, yank herself out of a position of pain to a position of clarity, which she's done in her life owing to her own uh, disturbed experiences in her own family. So I remember my mom always raised me with the motto that she'd always say, son, Every sob story has an expiry date. And once you move past that expiry date, you got to really hone in on the tools that are going to be useful to get you out of a mess. Because only you can do that for yourself. Because only you know how much it hurts. Only you understand how badly you need to recover. No one else can do it for you. So that desire to take ownership comes from my upbringing. Of course, like every mother and son, we have strong differences of opinion about a lot of things. And, of course, she uh, tends to be a hard taskmaster uh, in many ways. But I think uh, there is a deep respect we have for each other. And I still see her as my uh, lighthouse, you know, in the storm. She's someone I can really speak to if I'm uh, disturbed. But, of course, as every mother loves to worry, so does mine. <laughs> she's a mother, but she's a therapist. And that's all right, I suppose, uh, Sons are put on the planet to worry their parents to some degree. Yeah, I try to. Yeah. I try not to be too troublesome. Okay. So, what are some of the basics? You know, without giving the whole book away, obviously, but what are some basic tenets of transactional analysis that listeners can can hear to perk up their ears on on how this can help them? Well, I think the three fundamental principles are are so elegant in their simplicity, which is what I teach my students in their very first lecture. People are okay. People can think and people can change. When you say people are okay, it doesn't mean that every behavior of theirs is all right. Uh, what it essentially means is that despite dysfunctionality and bad choices and really shitty journeys <laughs> to the finish line, people are okay. We're all right uh, in being bruised. We're all right in spending some time, sometimes trying to light a fire in, in the middle of nowhere. But we're okay. We'll be all right if we allow ourselves to think and if we allow ourselves to be influenced by the information that is definitely going to work to get us out of the mess that we find ourselves in. So these are three wonderful philosophies to live by, that people are okay, people can think, people can change. And then TA's recommendation is to aim for autonomy so that no one can pull your strings, right? Like that song in the movie Pinocchio, there are no strings on me. TA also recommends intimacy in that um, you are able to form close bonds with other human beings. And uh, I think it's an essential tenet of 
cooperative living, right, where you can make good friends and good memories and just live life uh, in collaboration and in sync with other people. So that's um, also a recommendation that TA makes is uh, for authenticity. So you can be real about who you are. There's no double bind messages. There's no room for sarcasm. There's no room for patting things down. Everyone talks straight to the point. There's a certain keeping it real attitude underlying the effort of TA. So authenticity, autonomy, spontaneity, and intimacy, these are the recommendations of TA. In addition to that, there's also script theory, whereby we talk about how life journeys are essentially, a, I would say, a accumulation of the stories that we tell ourselves about our lives. For example, if a boy has been really scolded a lot by his father while he was raised, he may tell himself the story, I'm unlovable and nobody wants me around. I'm so unlovable and nobody really wants me around. Nobody loves me and I'm just a pain to be around. And that story will compel him, but it's what we call the script, will compel him to, even when he seeks love, worry that his woman may leave him or that she may cheat on him. Perhaps because this story of nobody loves me and nobody wants me around or the script has now made him a prisoner of his own mind in that he's not able to see facts as they exist. He's able to uh, not look at himself or his situation objectively. So we talk about script theory, script processes, and of course, it really goes into a, a lot of detail thereon. So yeah. Mm. Well, what about when dealing with other people? Like what, um, at STA, help you deal with someone that you may feel as being selfish or, you know, incredibly angry or depressed or uh, narcissistic or whatever it may be? You know, how do you deal with these things that you may perceive in other people? I think there's always a starting point to all patterns and TA encourages you to sort of weed out an individual's patterns and habits and the ruts and repetitive behaviors with a certain benevolence of spirit and with a certain academic rigor so that you don't see a person as selfish or um, you know, aggressive, you see them as having made the choice towards selfishness and anger, perhaps at an earlier stage in their life, when that may have been a legitimate defense strategy or that may have been a way to protect themselves against a hostile environment. So Tia likes to go back to the source and look at the pattern and then work with the client to find a way forward without radically, you know, juxtaposing judgment on the client. So, I find that it's like an x-ray for, for human personality. And that's what I like because when you look at an x-ray, you know exactly where the bone is cracked. You know exactly where the tumor is growing. You know exactly where the internal bleeding is happening. You can see it in the x-ray. The same way, TA helps you understand how a person chooses to spend their time, what stories compel them in their personalities, why they are stuck in certain attributes so we talk about structural pathologies in TA, why people get stuck in a parent ego state or a child ego state or why they exclude certain ego states. Uh, so these are very interesting and fascinating concepts once you're familiar with the jargon. And TA creates a very uh, colorful family of words that can be referred to. And, you know, like any classification system, you know, if you're able to organize data a certain way, you're able to understand and make sense of that data better as well. How much um, of a person's behavior relates back to how they were raised and how they were treated as a child? I'd say almost, uh, I'd say almost 70 to 80 percent because, you know, there's the entire debate between nature and nurture. Nature is what you're born with, you know, your genetics and certain temperamental dispositions that are a part of your constitutional makeup and uh, nurture, which is who surrounded a child in the first seven years of his life. It was it grandparents, cousins, extended family members or the parents or foster parents or were they raised by older siblings. So you'll be surprised how those uh, influences can even permeate and affect several generations of a family. For example, my grandfather was a freedom fighter during the uh, time when India was occupied by the British rule. So he was raised by a village school inspector, my great-grandfather, who at the time, of course, placed a lot of importance on education as a form of revolution against the British, that if you are educated, you can wear a coat and sit at the same table as, you know, 
are invaders and speak their language and perhaps someday this country will be free. And based on those ideas of revolution, my grandfather developed an almost worshipful quality towards the idea of going to college, going to university, getting a degree, getting a job and not being a financial liability on the family. And then those attitudes permeated my father's generation, which is why everyone is constantly, you know, talking about how much money they have successfully saved and how their children have, you know, gone to certain pedigreed institutes of higher learning. But then what happens is that's where it ends. What about other aspects of human living and what about warmth? What about camaraderie? What about collaboration? What about communication? But then those areas may have gotten uh, slightly ignored uh, because my grandfather was like, yeah, just get a degree, be, you know, don't be a liability and, you know, live a dignified life where you are part of the learned few, but that's it. So that's where upbringing permeates several generations and it takes someone, I, I would think, a little pissed off and a little curious and mischievous to sort of pull these strings apart and sort of untie those knots and really figure out why are we this way? Why do we talk this way? Why do we sit this way? Why do we make friends of a certain type? So that's where TA can be a very good supplementary tool to that kind of detective work, which you do in your life and which you help your clients do in their lives. Well, um, I guess inevitably it'll it'll get uncomfortable, I would think, for most people. How do you, how does TA instruct somebody, not only this is a, a way to x-ray your personality and find out what drives you, but how to deal with the uncomfortableness and maybe the feelings of, uh, I don't want to go there, that may arise. I think inherently all change is uncomfortable and I feel it is by design that discomfort is a sort of catalyst and it sort of galvanizes you and energizes you. And I don't think any innovative solution has been found from a place of comfort and great ease. I think even when man was living in caves, he moved from being a cave dweller to being a nomadic traveler because his food sources or his hunting grounds were drying up from a resource perspective and that led to a problem of not just nutrition but also how do we eat, how do we live, how do we sustain, how do we stay disease free, how do we protect the tribe and then that necessitated the exploration that followed right as nomads and then the agriculture was the next natural step. So I think necessity is the mother of invention but frustration is the father of I think, change <laughs> to that degree. So, I mean, how can you really find interesting ways to live your life unless something uninteresting has first grabbed hold of you long enough and boredom and fear, uh, as frustrating as it is, is in fact mm. the kick on the butt that you need to sort of, you know, chug along and move at a certain speed. Is the unfortunate oh. paradox. You need something shitty to happen before something great happens later. So how does someone deal with how they were raised as a child and then would they have trauma in their life? Like someone that's um, a compliant child or someone that's rebellious, you know, now they, they run into some kind of trauma. How would the different, you know, like archetypes react to trauma and how do they, how do they deal with it? I think a point has to be reached where we stop blaming our upbringing because if you've had a troublesome upbringing, and no doubt many of us have had such accidents uh, in our life with our family members and we've just not been happy with the attention we were given or we felt we deserved better. No doubt we will have an emotion about it and as you said very correctly, the compliant child ego state which is based in fear or the rebellious child ego state develops which is based in, you know, an oppositional streak may develop, but these are, as uh, TA explains it, defense strategies or maladaptive strategies that have long lost their relevance. In the same way you don't wear clothes that you wore when you were 12 years old anymore, even though they're still your clothes, because it doesn't fit you. Similarly, we have to, the way we change our hair and our clothes, got to do the same with our attitudes. And uh, TA forces people to take accountability of that change and uh, what I like about TA is not just it, it's a little bit of social work it's a little bit of detective work it's a little bit of psychology but uh, you know it's also a little bit of what what someone may dub as common sense and it only feels common after you've really understood the nomenclature and the 
underlying principles that govern it. And of course, there is trauma, as you very correctly said. There is trauma. But trauma might not necessarily be healed by tea. Then you have other modalities that come in. Uh, you have journaling work. You have behavioral experiments that are designed to challenge certain deeply entrenched habits. Um, you, uh, of course, talk about things and you develop a bond with your therapist who's able to put a different spin on things. And uh, it's a very iterative and gradual process, one that I believe should not be rushed. Um, so, I don't know, what are what are some strategies that people can, can use to take stock of themselves without putting the blame on themselves or on others? Like, what is... Um... Where does blame go in a healthy analysis of one's self? I think blame is punitive in its um, bearings per se. I think instead of assigning blame, it's important to accept responsibility and also remind yourself that you are not special and you are perishable like every other person on this planet. Greater men and women have existed before us. They have had their evolutions. They have had their evolution. And they have joined the dust of their ancestors. So I think if you treat yourself with a certain amount of regard, but also with a certain amount of realism to your problem, and put your problem on a scale, this is a technique I, I like to use, in uh, which, I, which my mother uses in REBT. It's called the awfulness scale. So my mom used to tell me as a kid, she said, at a hundred, let us imagine you've lost your legs, all the money you've ever made, your house is destroyed in a storm, your parents are dead, and any friend who could have helped you is no longer accessible to you. Why don't you put that on the scale as? I would always say, oh, well, that's a 100 in terms of the 0 to 100 scale. And she says, so now tell me the fact that you don't want to do your maths homework. Where does that fall on the scale? So I contextualize it. I say, oh, well, well, that's not even a five. She says, you see what I mean? It could always be worse. It could always be a lot more uh, harder to deal with. So really, it's about you and your attitude. And it's about time you stop blaming other people and take charge because life is a gift. As cheesy as it sounds, it, it, could, it could have been anyone else that was born in your place. But, well, here you are. What are the odds that you wouldn't have been born a ladybug or a rhinoceros? You're born as a human being. You have the love of humanity in your heart. To quote Chaplin from The Great Dictator, you know, you have the love of humanity in your heart. So what's stopping you from directing some of that love towards yourself, to finding interesting ways to keep your head above the water? Oh, very interesting. Does there seem to be any situation or any circumstance that TA just still can't reach? Uh, is, there any, yeah, is there anything that TA really doesn't uh, seem to have any help with? So I think... Uh, being an analytical framework, right, you you sometimes have to be someone who's very in touch with his past. So TA may not be as effective with people who have buried a lot of memory from their past because the key role that analysis plays is you have to have data to analyze in the first place. And if you don't remember your past or if there are psychopathologies present or there are personality disorders present and there is just so much volatility and instability in the person's on, you know, mood stabilizers per se. Um, in such cases, TA may not be the right approach, you know. I mean, you have so many ways in which you can help people. My wife is a play therapist. She works with the younger children and, you know, children who can't express themselves and really they can't analyze themselves, but they express themselves through play, through movement and through storytelling. And uh, through that, you can sort of gain a very clear understanding of where they're at in their pain or in their journey. So I think a mix of methods is usually the smart way to go about it. So it's not so much about what method you're proficient at as a therapist, but really a question of what approach can help your client recover the fastest and in the most permanent mm -hmm. way, which is why every therapist must update themselves with other modalities as well. And sometimes you don't even need to use a method. You just need to be empathetic, respectful, foster an environment of trust, be very patient, be sensitive, and uh, speak in a language or in a manner or at a pace that the client can appreciate, not just you throwing jargon left, right, and center. How do people react when they first uh, start to understand TA or they're exposed to it? Is there a lot of resistance? Um, you know, what do you notice in people? How does it change them as they get into it? So 
three distinct reactions I have seen, especially in my students. The first one is it scares the shit out of them that so much has been happening below their noses and mm. an autopilot. The second is some become temporarily very self-righteous about how they want to help others change or how they want to hold their families responsible for all the mistakes they believe those family members have made during their upbringing. And the third is that it makes them, uh, the third reaction is they feel humbled by what they have learned. And instead of being self-righteous or being frightened, they really take charge of their lives and say, oh, well, I guess my recovery has always been and will always be in my hands. And to some degree, I am in charge and of course the random nature of life and you know sometimes you just have to deal with complicated people and frustrating situations and really it's a human reaction in a human dilemma in that moment but the fact is i hold the reins to my recovery and even though the recovery might not be obvious or immediate it will happen if i am in charge to some degree hmm. well that's a good way to put it it's, it's taking the self-responsibility are there certain types of people that just seem to be resistant to TA that just, it just doesn't work for them or they just, they can't break through? Are there other methods that, that are workable? You know, I read about like very, very briefly, like, uh, internal family systems. And that seems like this, uh, like crazy intense therapy for people that are just off their rocker. Um, but you know, like, what have you seen with, with transactional analysis? Like how is it universally effective? Like, you know, who gets help from it? Who does it? I think people who don't get help from TA are also the same people who won't be helped by REBT because they constitute the self-congratulatory population where they are busy shaking hands with themselves and they enjoy cribbing about their lives. There's a certain glamour about talking about how much you've suffered or my suffering is the worst suffering and my suffering has purified me and made me worthy of all the attention that I feel I deserve. So when you fall into that kind of victim mindset and you really enjoy just talking about your trauma, you know, it's almost trying to get some kind of voyeuristic attention towards it, directed towards it. So that's where I feel uh, a person doesn't want to be helped. They just want to run in the same place, you know, and not really reach anywhere. And mm. uh, they enjoy in their personal relationships to some degree tell other people that, oh, you can't help me with my problem because this is an unsolvable problem. And, you know, it's extremely deep and it's extremely far reaching in a way that no therapist can help me. And then they introduce a bias towards the process of therapy or they may have even a gender bias towards a therapist because uh, in India, at least a lot of people who are therapists are actually just are women, not many men, surprisingly, in, in as therapists. So, a bias is reduced. There is a general resistance. And that's, I feel, the greatest distraction from any therapy work, not just TA. So, then that suggests that not just TA can't help you, nobody can help you because you have chosen not to want to be helped. You enjoy wallowing mm. self-pity and crying about how bad your life has been because you like the attention. You, you do like to feel special as a result of your tragedy, then that's very hard to break through, man. But, you know, if someone was really, like, significantly abused for a long time, let's say, I would think they may think, like, you know, why why did this happen to me? And, you know, what justice will come from it? If I let it go, maybe no justice will come. Maybe, um, the, you know, this unfair thing that I feel like happened to me, I don't know. It's um, maybe I can't let it go for some reason. Have you, have you seen that? Very true. But that's because they believe in some kind of final justice that is waiting at the end of a rainbow, like a pot of gold you have to collect. They don't understand the random nature of life. That No one enjoys suffering. We, no one wants to be in these compromised situations surrounded by a bunch of morons. But unfortunately, that is the nature of life. You know, you don't get to choose your families. You don't get to choose your school. You don't get to choose your name. You don't even get to choose your religious affiliation. You don't get to choose your extended family or even the friends you make. And when you realize how much you don't really get to choose, is it any wonder then that you're finding yourself in such a suboptimal state? So when you do have an opportunity to choose an attitude, choose an affiliation and choose a path of recovery, why not explore that since so much else was happening at the default setting? 
of life where you just kind of got dropped into a scenario where you didn't have the resources, the networks, the acumen, the experience or the communication tools to really get out of it. But now you do. So times have changed for you. I mean, is there any, any formal renunciation or letting go of the past that people have to do? You know, again, let's say someone was, you know, they, they feel like they were really hard done by. They, they truly grew up in a horrible situation. Is there a ceremonial thing? Like, how do they let that go so they can move on? I've always believed, not just in my years of practice, but I feel the human body, right? Now, the mind is a part of the human body. I believe uh, the human body knows how to self-regulate, right? I mean, it's how we naturally feel hungry when we're supposed to eat, when our eyes get heavy, when we are meant to sleep and let the body recover. I feel a similar process through time takes place for healing as well. So, of course, if you just, if one would make the argument that time heals all wounds, then someone may say, then why the hell do we need therapists? Well, we help expedite the process. So what may take 11 years can happen in for months when you have guidance, right? I mean, it's like you can't intuitively learn algebra without someone explaining to you the fundamental principles of algebra. Or you can't learn a language unless you've had adequate exposure to it and unless you can read and write the script. So similarly, therapy is meant to speed up what is already a very natural process, a process of recovery. So I think I take comfort in that uh, and maybe I'm uh, optimistic in my approach that things work out if you just give it enough time, find the right resources, have a little faith in yourself and understand that, um, you know, we're all a little broken and, you know, bent out of shape by our lives. And if we can just help each other get better or we can find someone with the capability of speeding up the process, things can improve for us. And it is that, I think that combination of faith and the work, putting in the work, so faith and hard work, you know, come that, I think, interesting things happen. So how have you seen uh, some people's lives transformed by this or yours? You know, like, you know, what are some examples that come to mind that just really delighted you or made you feel good? I think a lot of times, uh, a lot of the pain that people carry in their hearts is because of the way they feel their parents have done them dirty. So there's this myth that you only go to a therapist when something is wrong. But I think therapy is... I think, you know, it's like going to a cognitive gym where not just your relationships, your careers and personal growth are being focused on, but it's not it's just a place to go to because something is broken. You go there because something needs to be investigated. And I think people who want to investigate their relationships have made the most wonderful breakthroughs because they understand that in an investigation, there are multiple factors at play, right? And I think if they drop the notion that instant results are available, they may find themselves really enjoying therapy as well because deep transformation takes time and it requires a great deal of courage. I think also I have seen great results with couples where they have simply learned to communicate differently. So you'll be surprised mm -hmm. maybe notice that therapy sometimes takes on the role of an English language lesson. Or how do we speak in a manner that is impactful without it feeling threatening or without it feeling sanctimonious? How do we, um, you know, really communicate in a manner that doesn't put the burden of speculation on one's partner? So I feel in those situations, a great deal of progress can be seen tangibly where people learn to speak differently. People learn to courageously set up certain necessary fences and borders so that they aren't taken advantage of. So mm -hmm. I think psychology doesn't just belong in a university or a lab. It's something we can apply every day to our conversations and our decision making. And once a client understands that, that is not just me fixing my marriage or, you know, getting over my past, a, a sort of philosophy of life I need to embrace. And if there is no skepticism and there is an openness to learning, I think good things can happen, provided you believe they can happen. Mm. Okay. Is there a, um, a background or an upbringing that uh, tends to have the most trouble with, with allowing TA to help them? Are there certain kinds of people that, uh, I guess you said it before, you know, people that want to wallow in their, you know, in self-pity. But um, I don't know. Are there any other factors that uh, influence the advocacy of TA in someone's life? Like, okay. Is it something that uh, they should tell other people that they're doing and, you know, kind of talk to them about it? Or is it something they keep private? Like, you know, how have you seen it work? when you're counseling someone and they have people around them and they're letting them know what's going on. 
I usually tell my clients to keep the fact that they are going to a shrink or a psychotherapist private because the curiosity of other people can create some kind of contamination of perception. Someone may say, oh, I didn't know you were this depressed. Oh, I, I thought you were a lot more emotionally resilient. Oh, I didn't know you uh, had a, a lot of spare money to spend on these people. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, why can't you just be practical and positive and get over it? I mean, are you a child? So you see uh, that of uh, judgment comes their way. Yes, you were saying something? Oh, no, no, I just didn't. I get imagine that someone saying that to me and, you know, me saying that I'm you know, like feeling shame or, or saying, you know, mark off, all right. I'm trying to help myself, you know. It's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's no shame in wanting to seek support. I mean, if you want to learn to play soccer or you want to learn to, you know, play baseball or any sport, you do require some coaching to understand the rules and the techniques that govern the game. And if you look at life really as a game and the rules of the game, uh, you try not to get your head chopped off in the, you know, in the social hierarchy or you know, try to just keep your cool about yourself despite the noise that surrounds you and the speculation that surrounds you. I think if you see life as a game, then TA will help you understand the rules and help you improve your technique. If you look at it that way, I think for me, my vision has been to create an individual who can return to his society, an individual who is self-assured and doesn't blame himself for the pain that he had to go through, but uses that pain as a data point to make interesting choices for his life. And then that's how you create a functional society with less anger, less guilt, less jealousy, less pain, less trauma, less guesswork, uh, you know, and speculation about these gloom and doom situations that we frequently see online. Well, what, what does TA say to someone that has to interact with like a really toxic person at work or in a relationship or in family? You know, like what can you do where the counterparty you're dealing with like doesn't want to know TA, doesn't care, is not there to help themselves. They're just like impossible. Does it help you to deal with those people or does it just tell you to get away from them? Like what does it do? Well, getting away from them would be uh, the simple and elegant way to go about it. But I think it's also important to understand why p certain people have become this complicated or frustrating or what makes a bully a bully. And uh, I'm not saying that you instantly turn your frustration into compassion because that's not practical. Sometimes you just want to throw a shoe at someone, you know, and watch, watch them suffer. Uh, but uh, the fact is that we have no control over the suffering of others. To a large degree, they will make certain decisions that will exacerbate their own suffering. So I think TA largely helps you find your focus and center point so that you can better curate your tribe, right? I think within mm. the, you can create a smaller and more uh, warmer world with a few select people and how do you assemble your Avengers, so to speak? How do you, you know, seek them out? I think TA definitely helps with that, right? Because a lot of conflict is traced back to miscommunication. So TA helps you communicate your expectations more effectively. Mm. Is there an advanced form of TA or once you learn the basics and, you know, go through the system, um, is that all you need? Just practice. I think practice is, you're absolutely right, is really where it's at. But uh, as with all areas of academic inquiry, every person adds to the uh, literature of TA and may claim that this new concept will change the game. But largely, it tends to unfortunately become a bit of a pissing contest where everyone's sort of trying to have their name immortalized in the world of TA or CBT, etc. But I think... Mm. The reason we do this as therapists is really because I think all therapists have also dealt with personal setbacks, which is what made them choose this as a profession uh, in wanting to connect with people and help them find a clean way out of their problems. So I think it's important to not let the mission get diluted and the mission is to help and serve and to some degree protect, but also inform and educate and stimulate growth in the client. So once, as long as the mission is clear, it doesn't matter what method the client sort of migrates towards. You have to find a way to make it happen for them, to increase mm. the level of self-awareness in the individual. That's what TA really wants to do. Mm. Okay. No, very interesting. Um, so how can people find a, a, a TA practitioner? Are they rare? You know, like it, it seems like everywhere I turn, you know, when I've looked, it's everyone's CBT. 
there's a few other ones, you know, like eye movement therapy, MDR, you know, dialectic therapy, et cetera. But CBT seems to be dominant, or as you call it, RE, I think the acronym you used was. But um, where does someone find, again, a TA practitioner? I think uh, the U.S. as well has a, you know, has a circle and has a foundation. And there are certain, even Europe has it. So there are ways you can go on the internet. Now, a lot of people from the world of TA may either be a part of the academic resources and they may not really be practicing as therapists. So you're right, um, it's very hard to find someone exclusively using TA methods, but there is great uh, merit in CBT because the World Health Organization recognizes it as a legitimate intervention tool. So if you take the analytical framework of TA and sort of marry it with the more structured and focused didactic approach or active directive approach of CBT, I think you have something very interesting that you can blend together. So interestingly, apart from Essential TA, there's also a book called Essential REBT, which my mother and I have co-written. Largely, she's the author. I've just added a few uh, flourishes. <laughs> and uh, it's also our way to try to take psychology. Both books are on Amazon. We want to take psychology and demystify it. We want someone uh, who doesn't have any interest in the human mind to pick up the book and say, oh, Wow, this really puts things in perspective for me. So, where do we find a good TA practitioner? Well, you search online or you, you get a recommendation from the pre-existing therapists or psychiatrists or psychotherapists you have access to. And a lot of the literature is actually pretty simple to follow. I'm not going to try to uh, just pitch my book as the best book out there on TA. I'm sure there are many others capably written. But my book, I would imagine, tries to really, really, really simplify things, even for someone who has no interest in psychology. Yeah, I think yours, yours was very good. My wife tried to read the original works from like the 50s or 60s, and it was really tough. But yours was a, a, a really good condensation, and it was very clear. So I appreciate it. Just saying it Yeah, it was a pleasure writing it, because for me, if something is not able to be explained in simple words, it probably doesn't require to be explained at all. And that's mm. what I just simplify it, man. Don't show us how much you know. Show us how well you can package it, market it, and deliver the payload where it's required. I want to ask you one last thing. Um, what's it like being a therapist? Like it, at first, do you feel like everyone's a mess? And you know, like how does it affect your own personal life to hear story after story after story of trouble and triumph and failure and this and that and the other and you know some people just never being able to help themselves and some people helping themselves and doing well like how does that affect you in your life i think you develop two extreme attitudes depending on how much work you have you develop extreme compassion for everyone suddenly you aren't able to look at people as villains you look at everyone as um you know stuck and just because you're stuck doesn't make you a villain and there are sometimes you feel frustrated by an individual's inability to want to take ownership or transform, you know, their lives. I don't know which movie is it where there's a line, right? I find your lack of faith disturbing. Was it Star Wars? I have no idea. But I just, <laughs> that line seems to keep coming back to me. Like I find your lack of faith in your intelligence and in your ability to look at things and solve things very disturbing. So there are some days where I do find myself a bit exasperated by the stubbornness of certain clients, but I also understand that their stubbornness uh, comes from a place of habit rather than a place of vindictiveness towards me or the profession of therapy. And I, I say, all right, they're stuck. They're not villains. They're just stuck. And it's my job to sort of get them out of that dark hole that they've fallen into. I see it as everyone is sort of scrambling in the dark. Everyone's mm -hmm. For answers. Everyone's, we're all just the same. It doesn't matter where you're born, what your accent is or what your affiliations are. We're all dealing with the ghosts of the past. We've all had breakups. We've all had arguments with our parents. We've all worked jobs where we weren't fulfilled. We've all felt we deserved more money or recognition. We've all felt frustrated by the politics of our country. We've all been privy to certain socio-political influences. We've all had more money than we knew what to do with and at times had no money and therefore had nothing to do with the situation that we could have done. So these are such universal experiences and when you meet so many people and you hear their stories, it also gives you an understanding of just the entire 
humanness of it all. So, you know, I often tell my clients, I say, you know, it's not my place to fix you, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to shine a light so that you can fix yourself and I'll just be a library. You can just open a page and read the contents of that page and hope that the information you find there supports your own journey of recovery. So I'm not going to fix you or tell you how to live a better life. I'm just going to support whatever you need support in, like a good friend, uh, like someone who's got your back because clearly you haven't had that kind of unbiased support available to you. You're like what State Farm purports to be, a good friend when you need to. Yeah. Absolutely. But you, act, but you actually do it. Yeah. I was just teasing. But. I just want to. We, try to, we try to be friendly. We can't be friends with our clients, but we try to make the process as enjoyable and easy because it is pretty hard for some people to sort of open up, especially mm-hmm. the, the men who have been raised to be constantly strong and, uh, you know, bulletproof. Yeah. Well, all right. So um, for listeners, how can they dip their toe in and start finding out about transactional analysis? Like, you know, if you would just state the name of your book and where it's available and then um, maybe another resource or two for people. So the name of the book 